Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our 2022 Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series. Um, we are so glad to see some familiar names here on here as well as to see some new names on the, the participants list. And we're just grateful to be back in 2022 with Jessica Hill who presented last year on spring garden planning and she's going to help us get prepared for summer because right now is the time to plan for your summer vegetable garden. Um, so like I said this is our 2022 brown bag lunch and learn series. It's hosted by the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Um, that is the group that I'm with. My name is Dawn Coleman Lee. I'm the education activity specialist and we partner with the Alabama Cooperative Extension system, the Alabama Green Industry Training Center, the Jefferson County Department of Health, and um, Jefferson County Commission, City of Leeds, Alabama, City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, and the Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated every year to put these on for you all. And today we have a Alabama Cooperative Extension um, agent here with us, Olivia Fuller, who's going to introduce Jessica for us. Hello, yes, as Dawn said, I'm Olivia Fuller and I am with the Extension System. I'm the Commercial Horticulture Extension Agent um, for Auburn University and I cover 10 counties, Tuscaloosa, Pickens County, and down to Wilcox County and Choctaw County, so that side of the state. Um, but Jessica Hill, she has been with Jones Valley Teaching Farm since 2016. Jessica serves as the farm manager at their downtown farm location. Jessica holds a degree in sustainable agriculture from the University of Missouri and has years of vegetable farming experience from Missouri, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Her passion lies in soil health and in education. When she's not growing food and flowers, she likes to chunk discs at the George Ward Park and cook tasty food with the vegetables that she grows. So here's Jessica. All right, y'all, thank you so much. And thank you everyone to join for joining us. I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna go ahead and get started because I've got a lot to cover. All right, is that good? We can see that. Awesome. We can, we can see it. All right. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Generally, what I like to do is um, do introductions when I'm teaching classes, kind of get uh, an idea of how much gardening information everybody else is coming to the table with. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to do that today, but I'm going to try to cover some of the basics and go a little bit more into depth on tomatoes as well, because I know that is a summer favorite for everybody. Um, so just a short introduction, I wanted to give a plug for Jones Valley Teaching Farm, where I am currently farming. Um, so Jones Valley has been around for about 15 years now, um, and we have seven locations, six of which are in Birmingham City Schools. Um, this is Putnam Elementary's garden, We've got Glen Iris Elementary, Oliver Elementary, um, this is Avondale Elementary, and then we have Hayes K through eight here, uh, Woodlawn High School. And then this is our downtown location um, where I am stationed normally. And um, we have recently built what we called the Center for Food Education. So previous to this giant building, we were working out of a trailer and now we're going to have the capacity to be doing community classes and topics of agriculture and culinary skills. Um, as well as we're reopening our produce stand on April 4th um, and all of our produce will be given out to folks um, that could really use some produce and it will all be free there. Um, this is the, the building now that it's actually been built. Um, and then this, I just wanted to highlight our culinary studio, which is my most like favorite part of the building. So this area will allow us to do culinary demonstrations. So you can see at the front, there's a chef there, and then there's four tables, which we can hold about 10 people at each table that can kind of cook side by side with the chef. So really excited to be launching a lot of these programs um, this spring and summer. 
but just stay posted to our website if you're interested in um, volunteering or attending any of the classes that we will have to offer. So I am going to get started. Um, I've got kind of some gardening tips scattered throughout my presentation. And my first gardening tip um, that I always like to give is to just go ahead and start and fail. Um, this is the best way to learn. I actually, all of these pictures are a compilation of all of the mistakes that I made just last year um, from different diseases that I had to identify, different pest problems, not harvesting at the right time, um, some flooding issues that were going on. So, um, you know, and all of these mistakes that you see pictured here, I was able to learn from. So I think oftentimes people uh, are a little scared to start because they feel like they may not know enough. Um, and you will probably will fail, you know, if this is your first time starting. Um, but that is a great opportunity to learn from those failures. If you're seeing weird spots on your tomatoes, Googling those things, trying to figure out what they are, um, and you will become a stronger grower um, because of it. So what's growing on? Um, it is at the end of March. So your spring plants should mostly be planted out by now. Um, and if not, do it after this presentation or by late April. Um, so these crops include kind of your greens, um, some of your heading brassicas like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, um, all of your root crops are, are spring, spring vegetables and then kind of snap peas and fennel. So most of those things you should either already have a game plan for getting in the ground or should already be in the ground. And then uh, what's growing on for summer? So um, when I talk about summer growing, I'm really talking about from March to July um, because in March, we're gonna start sowing. That's kind of the earliest that you can sow things like um, bush beans and pole beans and squash and cucumbers, which um, most people consider summer crops. And then by the end of July, you should kind of stop planting all of those summer crops. So um, I have linked into here the planting guide for Alabama. This is an extension resource that I utilize at least twice a year when I'm crop planting. Um, and you can go through this resource and it will show you, um, you know, what crops you can grow in our zone, um, which by the way, our, our agricultural zone is 8A. Um, so that's a really important reference to have when you're thinking about what you can grow. Um, but it'll show you what you can grow and then when to plant it, at the, what spacing to plant. And then it even has recommendations for different varieties that you can grow that are um, tried and true for, for our climate. Um, so definitely recommend that resource. But um, for summer crops, generally we're thinking of the plant family of solanums and cucurbits. Um, so solanums encompasses things like tomatoes, hot peppers, sweet peppers, and eggplants. Cucurbits are things like cucumber squash, different types of melons. Um, beans are a summer crop. And then other plants like okra, corn, sweet potatoes, different types of herbs, um, cut flowers, if that's something that you're interested in, and arugula. Um, so generally when we think about summer crops, we're thinking about fruiting crops. So not necessarily like fruit in the sweet way that you think about fruit, but uh, fruit in like the biological way of, um, fruit is, um, the ovary of the plant that's protecting those seeds. And with fruiting crops, um, they have to be harvested more frequently. We'll talk about this later on in the presentation, but generally when you're thinking about summer crops, you're thinking about fruiting crops. So um, you're getting ready to plant your summer crops. Um, do you direct sow them into the ground or do you transplant them? Um, so direct sowing is taking seeds um, and directly putting them into the ground where they will continue to grow for the rest of their life or transplanting, um, which is starting seeds indoors um, in a controlled a climate controlled environment and then being able to put those outdoors where they will continue to grow. So what I recommend is that entire plant family of solanums, the tomatoes, the peppers and the eggplants, I really recommend transplanting those. These are very finicky crops. These are crops that have been 
um, highly bred over time and um, are really not meant to survive our climate um, is my personal opinion. Uh, I have a really hard time with tomatoes, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then direct sowing. Um, you can uh, transplant cucumbers and squash and melons and okra and corn. I haven't ever transplanted beans before, but um, not saying that you can't. Um, but these crops, you know, they they will uh, germinate under our conditions outside. And so it is just a, a better use of time and money to just go ahead and direct sow them into the ground versus spending time and money on um, potting mix and all the time in the greenhouse and that care and maintenance that goes into that. So um, really transplanting is, is mostly just your solanums and then direct sowing can be pretty much everything else. And then sweet potatoes are an exception. Um, you want to plant sweet potatoes from slips. So um, when your sweet potato sprouts greens, that is what is considered a slip. Um, you can buy these um, from different seed companies or you can save your slips. If you grow sweet potatoes, you can um, take some cuttings from your sweet potato plants and plant them in a pot and bring them inside um, if you have like a greenhouse or, or a grow light and continue to grow the greens and then cut them again and put them outside. Um, but yeah, sweet potatoes do from a slip. All right, my second best gardening tip is to start early, earlier than you think, especially right now um, with the pandemic, there's been a rise in the popularity of gardening and seed companies are selling out earlier and earlier. So if you really wanna get what you're looking for, um, I recommend starting as early as you can. So how early? Um, I do all of my crop planning in December. So I do my crop planning for the spring and the summer in December. Um, and that's when I go ahead and buy all of my seeds um, because we do have a greenhouse at our location. We're starting seeds in our greenhouse in February for um, summer planting. So all of those solanums, the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants that I was talking about, those were all started in our greenhouse in February. Um, those plants take about two months in the greenhouse to get like a good root system to be ready to be transplanted outdoors in April. Um, but if you're just buying um, from kind of like gar local gardening stores or big box stores and such, um, you can start to get ready to uh, buy transplants um, in, in April for, for that kind of stuff, if you're not starting your own transplants. Um, around March, I recommend trying to, to get out there and to prep your land. So emptying any, any of your beds that might still have plants in them or weeds, laying mulch and irrigation, and just kind of getting ready, um, the land ready for you to be able to plant in April. And then, like I said, in March, you can do your first sowings of beans and cucumbers and squash. Um, and then in April, you want to go ahead and put out your first succession of your solanums and any flowers, um, any tender herbs, so things like basil, cilantro, parsley, um, you can put out in April. And then you can start your first round of melons as well. So in our climate, the last frost date is around April 15th, um, or between April 1st and April 15th. So um, if, you if you don't have a plan to cover your plants with frost cloth um, using any kind of like frost pre prevention methods, then I would wait until uh, after our last frost date in April 15th to put uh, any of these plants outside. And then in May is when you wanna go ahead and transplant your sweet potatoes and you can continue, you know, if you don't get your tomatoes in, in, in April, that's not a big problem. You can continue to plant these things, um, peppers, tomatoes, okra, all of those things until about July. Um, once you hit July, you really wanna stop planting summer plants because they won't have enough time to mature before it starts getting kind of cold. Um, in June, is when, again, last when you do your last planting of corn um, and your last planting of any melons. 
And then June is when I start working on my fall crop plan. So um, thinking about all of those, those crops that I had mentioned at the beginning, all of those green, hardy greens and brassica uh, family plants, those are all gonna be planted again um, in the fall and in August. So I'm starting to plan for all my fall stuff in June. And then in June, I recommend not planting any cucumbers or squash. This has been, um, from personal experience, I found that the, um, the pickle worm that we have in this climate gets really bad in the month of June. And they, what they do is they'll um, take a, drill a small hole in the fruit and eat the fruit from the inside out and they are just really awful and I find that just taking a break in June from growing cucumbers and squash um, helps to prevent from getting that pest and then also from uh, powdery and powdery mildew which is also really bad and like really the thick of the summer. Um, so people ask me a lot about like, where do I get my supplies, my gardening supplies, um, and especially seeds. So I've listed out quite a few seed companies here. The top three are my favorite seed companies that I rely on the most. Um, it's really awesome when you can go to Southern seed companies because those seeds are grown in the South and you know that they can thrive in this really harsh environment that we have here. Um, so I, I highly recommend the three southern seed companies. If you're looking for cover crop, which we'll talk about cover crop a little bit later in the presentation, um, Petra Seeds and Universal Seed and Supply are both um, Alabama companies that I highly recommend. And then um, if you're looking for like a, a box store that you can go to, obviously like a Home Depot or Lowe's will have um, some stuff, but I find that their varieties um, are you know, they don't have uh, as much variety there. So um, some other places that you can go is sweet peas. I haven't personally been there, but I've heard good things about sweet peas and uh, Hannah's Garden Shop. The Birmingham Botanical Gardens has their plant sale. Um, I'm not sure when that is, but I think it's coming up soon. And then um, Jones Valley Teaching Forum, you can uh, get transplants from as well. If you are like a community organization or community garden that needs transplants, um, you can reach out to me uh, at jessicajbtf.org if you are interested in getting onto our community seedlings program where we just grow seedlings for, like I said, community gardens and such in the area. Um, and then I also listed some uh, seed companies that grow culturally important, uh, important seeds. So if you're really looking for like Palestinian or Syrian seeds um, or Native American seeds, you can go to some of these places and, and get seeds that you may not find in other places. Um, and then compost wise, um, we get asked about this a lot as well. Um, there's a new company called Field Culture that is um, starting, they, they've started collecting food scraps. So it's kind of a two part business. They collect food scraps, so if you are interested in composting your food scraps from home, you can um, get on, sign on to that program with them. And then they also sell the compost that they're making. Um, and then Mountain Brook Public Works, if you live in Mountain Brook, um, you can go to the Public Works Department and they will load you up with compost for $20. Um, or you can load it yourself for free, but... Um, it's, it's worth the $20. <laughs> um, and then uh, just other gardening supplies, whether it's you need irrigation, um, supplies or fertilizers. Johnny's Seeds offers a lot of that um, stuff. And I, I really like them for seeds and tools. Petals from the Past is really great if you're looking for fruit trees. We're not really gonna talk about fruit at all, but I love to plug them because they're just such a good resource. Um, they have fruit trees and then they also I sell a lot of like ornamentals um, and they, I, I believe they do vegetable transplants as well. Okay. All right, so transplanting tips for the summer. Um, for the summer especially, I re recommend a process called hardening off your transplants. So if you are growing in a greenhouse or you're starting stuff indoors, 
to bring those transplants outside and let them spend some time slowly in the heat um, and the, the harsh sunlight of the, our climate. So um, what I like to do is I'll put them outside for a couple of hours, bring them in, put them outside for a few more hours the next day, bring them in until they're, you know, I'll do this for about a week until they're out outdoors for a couple of days in um, the, the packs or, or their trays. And this just allows them to kind of slowly acclimate to the climate. Um, I have transplanted before some stuff that I did not harden off and it just like wilted or crisped in the field because it just was not used to the, the conditions outside. Um, and then space, this is always, I always harp on this, like make sure that you're reading your seed packet and your seed catalogs or your plant tags and looking and following the spacing that they recommend. Um, so oftentimes on your seed packet or in the catalog or the plant tag, it'll just tell you exactly how much space should be in between each plant. And this will really help with um, just the plant's overall health. Um, it won't be, it'll be less likely to contract diseases because there'll be enough airflow and it'll just grow properly. Um, so I think oftentimes I see this, this mistake with gardens, um, especially when it's a small plot because people get really excited and they want to grow all this kind of stuff and they plug a bunch of stuff in there and things just don't succeed. So if you really highly recommend, um, you know, making sure that your plants have enough space. And then before you transplant anything, make sure that you're getting that entire transplant wet. So making sure that the root ball is entirely wet. When I think about transplanting, I think about um, like, it's like a surgery, you know, you're removing it um, from one area and putting it into another. And so you just really wanna make sure that you're doing everything that you can to make that surgery go as smoothly as possible. Um, fertilizing your transplants as well will help. So what we like to do is we'll do them a dip in um, a fish emulsion and a seaweed blend. So um, the fish emulsion is very high in nitrogen and uh, the seaweed blend is high in potassium and um, in phosphorus and some other micronutrients. So giving them again that, that boost of fertility that they need to start um, thriving in this new environment. And uh, overcast days are always better to transplant in. So if you've got an overcast day coming up in the future, recommend um, doing it when it's not like beating down um, on the, the sun. And then planting into a weed-free garden, um, just you know, making sure that you're ahead of the competition on the weeds. Um, and then planting deeply. Um, this is something I always harp on volunteers to do. Um, if you plant your transplant too shallow, especially like with like a storm that we got last night, you can run the risk of those really thin stems snapping and breaking. So as long as the growth tip, which is the area where um, on the plant where new leaves are coming out is above the ground, you're good. So you can even like, you know, take leaves off and bury it further into the ground, especially if you get like transplants that are really tall or what we call leggy. Um, you really want to plant them deeply. So the first goal is, is to establish that root system and planting things deeper, especially things like tomatoes. If you plant that stem of the tomato deeply, that whole stem is going to turn into a root system and it's going to be much, um, it'll thrive much easier if it is planted deeply. And then just being mindful of pests at the time of planting. So, um, Sometimes I'll sprinkle diatomaceous earth, which is an organic insecticide around the plant. Um, it's something that if like uh, soft bodied insects crawl over that diatomaceous earth, it, it will like puncture them. It's like glass to them essentially. Um, so that's really good if you're dealing with any kind of like caterpillar type pests, um, but you do have to reapply it if it rains. So just be aware of that. And then uh, you can also use a row cover as well. So it's kind of like a blanket um, that you can use that is a pest exclusion method. So uh, once you put that over your plants, kind of whatever's in there stays in and whatever's out can't get in. And then I always recommend, especially as you're learning, you know, to label and to keep a record 
of the stuff that you're doing. So keeping a record of when you transplanted things and the variety and the location, because that will help you learn year to year knowing like, hey, I transplanted my tomatoes and on May 15th and I noticed that they didn't do as well. Maybe I need to start a little bit earlier or knowing the varieties that you did as well. So um, maybe your tomato didn't thrive because it wasn't a variety that was um, good for your climate. So just keeping as much record as you can of things and observations. I love to use uh, my camera on my phone to take pictures of things as well to kind of see, um, you know, year to year what, what things look like. And then uh, consider mulch. So uh, the picture that you see here is um, a paper mulch. It's an organic um, product that is, um, kind of has a mission to replace plastic culture. So we, we use this on the farm and I really like it, um, but you can also use like clean straw, um, wood chips and stuff, but this helps to keep the weeds down and also to, to help retain moisture in your soil. All right, direct sowing tips for the summer. Again, space, just making sure that you're giving enough space between um, each plant. And what I'll do sometimes with direct sowing um, to guarantee germination is I'll sow more seeds than I need to sow. And then we do a process called thinning. So as those seeds germinate, um, you can go through and pluck plants out in between to make sure that there's the correct like one or two inch spacing, whatever it is. What I like to do with like root crops is I picture like how big I want the root to be. So if I want the root to be like um, the size of a golf ball, I will thin to make sure that there is like a golf ball size space between each plant. Um, and then also making sure that your soil temperature is correct. So this will be on, should be on the seed packet or the seed catalog. Um, it will tell you kind of what the ideal soil temperature is um for sowing and then the depth of the seed this will again most of this information should all be on the back of the seed packet or in your seed catalog but the rule of thumb is to kind of do twice the size that it should be twice the size of the seed um, is how deep it should go and then uh this is probably the most important part about germinating and and doing direct sowing crops is to keep them really moist until germination. So even if you forget one day and it dries down and you can see that kind of like crispiness on top of your soil, what can happen is those plants are like germinating underneath the ground. They're very small, very fragile and can like pretty much crisp up within a day if you don't water. Um, so always making sure that you're keeping that soil moist until it germinates. And then also knowing when that crop will germinate. So for example, carrots take 14 days to germinate. And so, you know, you're not sitting there looking stupid a day like 21, still watering this spot. You can know that like my carrots should have been germinated by now. I can go ahead and re and try again. Um, and then also again, weed-free soil um, and then continuing to keep your soil weed free so you're not having any competition and then uh, always mark where you've sown as well and then again just keeping records of what you sowed what varieties and when you sowed space just give it enough space that's my biggest tip all right so let's talk about tomatoes since this is a summer um vegetable talk so there's kind of two groups of tomatoes, types of tomatoes. There are determinate tomatoes and there are indeterminate tomatoes. And so a determinate tomato is a tomato that is going to set one large crop of fruit and then die. And an indeterminate tomato is going to set a little bit of fruit here, a little bit of fruit there. It's going to continue to fruit for a longer time. Um, so the determinate tomatoes, I kind of like think of like the live fast, die young tomatoes, the indeterminate tomatoes are, are a little bit more modest and are gonna give you um, 
tomatoes throughout the season, but not in a huge um, amount at any time. So just depending on kind of what your needs are as a, as a gardener, um, choosing between a determinate or an indeterminate tomato. Um, and uh, determinate tomatoes and indeterminate tomatoes are also treated a little bit differently. So because a determinate tomato um, is supposed to kind of like live fast, die young, you're not gonna do any pruning generally on those. Um, on those, on determinate tomatoes, I like to just prune at the base so that I'm keeping any foliage from touching the ground that will help reduce disease. Um, but other than that, I'm not doing anything um, further in terms of pruning. With indeterminate tomatoes, um, I personally sucker our tomatoes and suckering tomatoes is a type of pruning. I'm gonna see if I can go. So um, these are two pictures of what a tomato sucker is. And you've got on a, on a tomato, you've got your main stem and then you have a uh, leaf branch and you'll see these, these branches just harbor leaves. They don't have any um, flowers and they won't produce any tomatoes. Um, but then in between there, in between that main stem and your leaf bud, you'll have um, what we call suckers coming out. And these are essentially like a whole new tomato plant. Um, they will produce flowers and tomatoes. And um, with indeterminate plants, because they're gonna be being produced for a much longer time than determinants, you really wanna make sure that there's enough airflow in there um, to reduce disease and you don't want it to be too crowded. Um, you also will get earlier fruit by pruning this way because you'll be concentrating that energy into um, the shoots that will produce kind of your first tomatoes. And so these are um, pictures of suckers. The picture on the left, I think is, it, I would not sucker that because it's a little too big for me. You know, making big cuts into your plants, you always run the risk of getting disease through, through those wounds. Um, but the picture on the right is where I like to get my suckers. So where they're really just super small and you can, you don't need to use pruning shears or anything and you can just pinch them off. Um, but that's kind of a, a garden preference thing. Some people are in the camp of not suckering, some people do. Um, I recommend, um, you know, suckering one and not suckering the other um, and seeing which, which one you like more. Um, starting with hardy varieties is particularly important for a uh, crop like tomatoes that just is like inundated with so many different diseases in our climate. Um, the varieties that I really recommend are from Johnny's Seed Company and um, they're what I call a fake heirloom. So it's a hybrid plant that is like meant to taste like a brandy wine tomato or um, a black beauty or something like that. So these are um, hybridized tomatoes. They are um, bred specifically to um, have like disease resistance and, and hardiness, but are also um, bred with that flavor in mind as well. So for me, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Having that heirloom flavor with that disease resistance package is really great. So um, if you go on to Johnny's and you're looking through the seeds, if you see one that looks like an heirloom that you really like, um, and it says F1, that means that it's a hybridized version of that heirloom. And uh, the seeds are really expensive, but highly recommend them. All the tomatoes in this picture here are all those fake heirlooms. Um, and I just think they do really well. Uh, and you really want to start with good transplants. I see like so many people transplanting things from like Home Depot and Lowe's that are like two feet tall. Um, I do not recommend buying a two feet tall tomato plant. You really want to get your tomato about eight to 10 inches. Um, you know, if you start off with a bad foundation, you're going to end with one as well. So really starting with a good transplant, um, one that doesn't look really sickly and is not leggy or like really tall. Um, is going to be your best bet. And then, like I said, plant deeply. Um, all of that stem portion will turn into a root system if you plant it deeply. Um, and then thinking about whether you want to cage or stake your tomatoes, just depending on kind of what your setup is. 
Um, watering in tomatoes is um, really important. So watering consistently is incredibly important, especially when we're thinking about calcium. So if you think back to any tomatoes that you've grown, and if you've had any tomatoes that have like that brown, but it's like a flat area on the bottom that's kind of mushy and nasty, that is blossom end draw, and that's caused by a calcium deficiency, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your soil is calcium deficient. So I always, always recommend soil testing before the beginning of the season, um, because that way you can know if you're experiencing blossom end draw, it may be because of calcium deficiency, but also maybe because you're watering incorrectly. Um, so calcium is moved through the plant through water. Um, and if you're getting really inconsistent watering, then your tomatoes are not able to access that calcium. So, um, and I know, uh, you know, if you're, if you're growing tomatoes outside, you're kind of screwed oftentimes because you can't really control um, the amount of water that you're getting out there on your crops. Um, that's why most like commercial farmers are growing in high tunnels, um, doing tomatoes in high tunnels and stuff. Um, but if you can control the watering, try to try to do it on a schedule um, and then also allow for some dry down as well. So you want the soil not to be completely dry, um, but at least dry on the, the first one to two inches so that um, you're just uh, so that it's not like sitting in water all the time. Their tomatoes roots don't like to be sitting in water. And then fertilization. Um, I'm not really going to give too much advice on fertilization because you should be basing all of your fertilization needs on your soil tests. Um, but giving those fertilis um, giving those transplants a, a dip in a fertilizer will really help. And then um, fertilizing with some sort of insoluble fertilizer, a slower release fertilizer when you transplant. And then it's also recommended to then again fertilize when you start getting a fruit set, when your fruits are about a nickel sized. And then just don't do it, overdo it on the nitrogen. Um, this is true for really any plant that you are not trying to eat the leaves. If you're trying to eat the leaves, go for nitrogen um, because that is what nitrogen does in the plant. It is going to produce a really nice set of leaves for you, but that's not the goal for tomatoes. So do not overdo the nitrogen. Um, and that can also be part of the reason why you're having calcium problems as well is because uh, too much nitrogen can affect uh, your plant's ability to grab calcium as well. And then mulching is really gonna help to um, A, keep down the weeds obviously, but B, to um, kind of retain some of that water in um, your plant's um, root systems. And then disease in tomatoes. I am by no means an expert in tomato diseases. Um, I feel like no matter what I do, I get some sort of disease on my tomatoes. Um, but these are some tricks to kind of prevent or at least prolong the health of your plant. So um, space, it's always about space. Um, preventing disease, if you give it enough space, getting enough airflow, airflow is key when preventing disease. And then keeping your foliage dry. So you never wanna water the top of your tomato plant. Um, when you're watering, you should always keep that water right at the base and try to avoid as much splash back as you can. That also, mulching also helps with that splash back as well. So a lot of these diseases are soil borne diseases. And if you are um, getting soil somehow onto the plant's leaves, then uh, that will allow the soil borne diseases to enter through the plant. Um, and then planting resistant varieties. So as you, as you garden tomatoes, kind of keeping track of what diseases that you're getting. And then when you go to purchase seeds, trying to purchase seeds that have those resistance. Um, so late blight and early blight are two really common ones that, that we get here in this climate. So looking for seeds that say that there are, have some sort of resistance is the best thing you can do. Um, and then keeping plants clean. So if you are seeing any disease, like the picture on the right, pruning that stuff out um, as long as it's not like the entire plant, obviously you don't want to prune like all of your leaves off. You still need leaves for photosynthesis, but um, trying to uh, keep those plants um, what we call clean. 
by just taking off any damaged or diseased foliage. And then a healthy plant, as always, is going to be kind of the best defender against diseases and insects. Um, so the, having your plant um, properly fertilized and planted properly and keeping it watered and all of those things that we do to care for plants is going to uh, make it so that your plant is um, stronger to fight against any diseases or insects. And then organic fungicides, I'm not sure if I can, I'm going to try clicking on this link so that I can show you this site here. Um, Cornell is a great resource for all things agriculture. It really, any of our land grant universities um, are really good resources. Anytime that I'm Googling anything garden related, what I like to do is like, I'll Google like um, yellow spots on my tomatoes extension. Um, because that will show you all university resources and you're not gonna get resources like gardeningknowhow.com um, that are not as reliable. Um, so these, this is a list of all um, biopesticides. So biopesticide meaning that these are um, organisms or like microbes that they're using to fight diseases. Um, one of my favorites is actinovate. I also really like double nickel 55 and um, serenade as well. Um, Milcure is great for um, downy mildew um, or sorry, powdery mildew. Uh, but this, this resource is really great. If, if you get good at identifying diseases, then, um, you can kind of purchase, uh, in, or not insecticides, um, purchase fungicides for some of the problems that you're experiencing. But I don't recommend just like spraying fungicides. Um, and also this list is all organic fungicides, um, for the record, but yeah, don't recommend just like spraying fungicides. You really want to know exactly what that disease is and then spraying for that. Um, one really great resource at the Botanical Gardens is their plant pathology lab. So if you are unable to kind of identify a disease through Google, you can bring um, either a clipping from that plant or um, an entire plant into the plant pathology lab at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens and they will identify what type of disease that you have. And that way you're not um, kind of just spraying fungicides willy-nilly. You can buy a fungicide that is for whatever disease that you are facing. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to expand my screen again. Oh, this is good. We'll just do this. All right, that was tomatoes. Now we'll talk about summer harvesting. These are your hashtag goals. So knowing your harvest indicators is really important, especially for our fruiting crops, because, um, you know, you really, if you miss one day of harvesting, you can end up with ochre like a uh, picture in the right um, that is way too long and is going to be really woody. So you will be able to, you can read up on harvest indicators on um, a lot of seed catalogs will say like, pick when, you know, three to four inches long and the tip of the okra shouldn't be firm, it should be bendable um, or whatever, whatever it is. So knowing what to look for um, when your plants ripen is really important. And then for fruiting crops, so um, tomatoes, okra, eggplant, hot peppers, sweet peppers, um, at our farm, we're harvesting about twice a week on those, um, especially on okra and tomatoes. Um, without that twice a week harvest, you, you're going to end up with stuff that's oversized or with tomatoes, that's stuff that's cracked or diseased. Um, and I also, with tomatoes, I tend to, to harvest on the greener side of things and then ripen them off the plant because you just, the longer you leave it on the plant, the, the longer you're running the risk of an insect or a squirrel or something getting to it before you do. Um, have a game plan for sanitation. This is extremely important if you're um, selling or giving away produce to other people. So making sure that whatever you're harvesting into any buckets or tools that you're using um, is sanitized. So is cleaned and then sanitized with like a bleach solution. Um, and then going out and just being prepared when you go out to harvest. So a lot of times like 
I'll see folks in community gardens that are like harvesting like lettuce and just kind of setting it to the side on the ground or something like you really want to like go out there and be prepared with a tote um, to put things into um, and especially putting things in the shade as well if you're like growing any types of greens uh, throughout the summer like you know a couple seconds in our Alabama heat will just toast them so making sure that you're keeping things in the shade um, and then making sure that you're bringing what we call a seconds tote with us so this is like um, okra that's oversized or tomatoes that have cracked or peppers that have diseases you don't want to throw those plants on the ground because that can attract pests that like those crops um, and then they can move on to your your plants that are growing currently so I like to always take those things to the compost instead of just leaving them out and then having a having a plan for uh, how you're going to process and store so it's really important to get what we call field heat off of your plants so that's just like the heat that is in your fruits or vegetables when you harvest them so cooling them down using like um, a cool bath or um, some ice water or something being able to dunk them in and then let them dry out before you store them so that they're not going into the walk-in really hot or, or your cooler, whatever you store your vegetables in. All right, and then it looks like, let me check the time really quick. It's got a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna speed through some of these last tips. Cover crops are awesome. These are plants that we grow um, not for us, but for the soil. Um, so these are really good to plant when uh, you don't have like a game plan for uh, what you're going to do with the soil. Like if you take out like your lettuce and then you don't have a plan to put anything in it until the fall, you can plant a cover crop. Um, they're really good at suppressing weeds. This uh, stand right here is on the picture in the left is sun hemp. Um, and this plant can get about 14 feet tall. I uh, do not recommend this for like garden scale because it's really hard to, to mow down. Um, but some other varieties that I have recommended on here, buckwheat is um, my most highly recommended one for gardeners because it, grow, it grows really quickly. It's got a maturity date of like 30 to 40 days and um, it's really good for pollinators and it's really easy. It doesn't grow very tall and it's really easy to incorporate back in. But these plants, um, the purpose of them is to grow them and then incorporate them into the soil. So you're feeding your soil food web, you're increasing organic matter. Um, because your soil is covered, you're decreasing erosion and you're decreasing weeds. Um, and some of them also fixate nitrogen. So they're able to grab nitrogen that's in the air that's not available to other plants and then put it into their root system. And then when you mow them down or incorporate them into your soil, that nitrogen is available for your next round of crops. Um, similarly, if you have some land that is fallow that you don't have a plan to plant anything in it, if you can't do cover crops, I do consider, I would consider tarping um, or putting just like, you can even use cardboard. Um, we've been using burlap that we're getting for free from um, some coffee roasters in town but uh, this just allows like no weeds to grow and it also prevents erosion. And it's really great if you're gonna use it to um, warm your soil up in the spring. So laying down, especially if it's got black on the top, it'll really heat that soil up so that you're able to plant a little bit sooner because your soil temperatures are higher. Um, considering irrigation before you go to plant. So we use a lot of drip tape irrigation, which is the picture on the left. Um, and then you can also do kind of an overhead watering or, you know, if you've got a hose, spraying with your hose. Again, like I said, plants, are, plants drink from the roots for the most part. So really getting that water to where they need it is the best practice and not drenching that foliage in water will help prevent diseases. Um, but if you are germinating crops, overhead irrigation, which is on the picture in the right, is the best to kind of be able to fully saturate that soil so that you're making sure that you're getting even watering. Um, because of the drip tape, it really only waters about six inches out from um, either side of the drip line. Um, but drip line is really great for, for transplanted crops. 
Um, you can consider trap cropping, especially if you've got a little bit more land. So the picture on the right is a stand of sorghum and sunflowers, and uh, they're planted next to our tomatoes. So the idea of trap cropping is you're, um, you're growing a pest's most favorite crop. So to try to kind of appease them and attempt them to go to that crop instead of the crop that you want to eat yourself. So um, these are recommendations um, that are given from our friend, Dr. Ayanava Majundar at Extension um, for different trap crops, depending on which type of pest that you have. Um, again, like I said, just utilizing your seed companies um, for information about planting. Uh, Johnny's Seeds has a lot of great information about um, each of their crops. So here, this video, um, I just typed in Valero carrots. It's a carrot that we like to grow in the fall. Um, it gives you a description of um, kind of what the crop is and if it has any resistance to diseases. You can see here it was resistant to powdery mildew and alter alternaria blight. Um, and then it shows a bunch of growing information. So it's going to tell you um, how, how deep to plant things, well, how many days to germination, um, any harvest tips, optimal soil temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you are unsure about things, just utilizing whatever seed company that you're using, they have a wealth of information on their sites. Uh, extension is an awesome resource. This is our contact information for Jefferson County's Extension Office. If you have any questions about gardening, these are the people to go to, these are experts. They also have a couple apps out. Um, they have the Sow Planting app, which um, helps you keep track of what you're planting and when to plant them and has suggestions on um, what to grow. And then the Farming Basics app, is really great for trying to identify insects and diseases. So you can go on there, you can pick a crop like apples, and you can see what diseases that apples commonly get in this area. And it even has pictures of what those diseases look like and stuff. So that is a great resource for trying to identify things. And that's all I've got for today. Thank you so much. Hey, um, thanks, Jessica. We have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to do the Q&A questions and then pull the questions from the chat that I saw. Okay. Hannah, oh, Hannah Smith wants to know the best local shop for soil and mulch to be cost effective. Hmm. <clears throat> I honestly, I'm not sure. Um, we... We get our, all of our mulch for free from people that uh, chip trees. Um, Gray's Tree Service, I believe you can go there and load up a truck for free because it's like a byproduct that they have that they're not utilizing. Um, so any kind of tree services is really good for if you're looking for wood chip mulch. Um, in terms of soil, I'm just not sure. Um, we haven't had to import soil. I just don't know, I'm sorry. Where do you suggest, suggest getting a soil test? Where? Mm -hmm. um, the Birmingham Botanical Gardens uh, has soil testing available. So for $7, you can get a pretty generic soil test. And um, if you're worried about heavy metals, which in some locations, especially in like areas in the north side that have been really <laughs> heavily polluted by industry, um, those soils are sometimes unsafe to grow in. Um, so I do recommend check if you haven't had a soil test previously, making sure that you're getting the heavy metals test as well. Um, I'm not sure if that's an extra fee, but, um, just making sure that when you do get your soil test, that they're also testing for that, but the Birmingham Botanical Gardens is a great resource. Um, Laura said that she's about 40 miles north of Birmingham near Rickwood Caverns. Is that still zone 8A? So Birmingham is kind of like, it's 7B, but I think with climate change, it's more like 8A. Um, so I believe that you would be in 7B, um, but the climates are very similar still. Like I think 7B's um, last frost date is April 15th, whereas 8A is April 1st. So it's very similar. 
Anne wanted you to de define clean straw. Um, clean straw just means that it doesn't have weed seed in it or any persistent herbicides. So um, oftentimes, and persistent herbicides are herbicides that will um, stay in the straw. And then when you use it on your crops, um, that herbicide can, can come out and, and injure your crops. We've had that happen at Jones Valley before and it's devastating because um, you really like, I mean, you lose everything. Um, so just when you go to source straw, just asking um, the supplier like where they got it from, if they know that if it was sprayed with any herbicides. Um, I really avoid straw. I haven't found a good person to get it from that I feel like I can trust. I'm just so weary of it because you can also get weed seeds. You can get like weeds that you've never had um, with straw. So I, I tend to stick away from it. Okay. Um, the next question is from Susan. Do you prune tomato plants that grow very tall? Yes, but you want to make sure that you don't like, if you want to stop the growth, you can like prune the very top of your tomato. But once you, you hit that growth tip, um, where it's it's growing from the top like it's not going to really grow any any taller after that um, so if you are trying to control growth pruning the top um, will work but yeah I any plants that that are like any tomato plants that that grow tall which is generally indeterminate plants I will prune and Hannah um, just clarified that she has a lot of red clay at her house so she she's going to have to get some growing soil I think extension has some um resources for people who have red clay too in order to get the soil that you want for growing vegetables but also they just encourage people to grow plants that grow great in soil the red clay soil anyway um so I would reach out to extension if I were you Hannah yeah, I think like typically like landscape supply companies will offer like topsoil um, if that's if that's the route you're looking to go. But you can also just use compost and and kind of continue to layer organic materials on. Um, and if you've got really heavy like clay that you can't grow in, like I recommend spending a few years like adding organic matter. Growing cover crops is another great way. So. Um, growing crops and then mowing them down and continuing to kind of layer that organic matter will really help your soils. And I heard worms were good for converting clay. Yep, that helps. Uh, and Hannah said that she thinks she meant from the seedling stage. I'm on Ruffner Mound is already, okay, we did that. I don't know if it's the seedling stage talking about the zones for 7A, 7B and 8A possibly. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> and Hannah says she's been doing vermiculture. So, cool. what is the best mulch for raised beds? Hmm. I'm not sure if it's any different from in ground growing. I think it really just depends on what you have access to. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, we use a lot of wood chip mulch. We use paper mulch. Um, we'll mulch with plants too. So like our cover crops, when we uh, will grow them and mow them down and then leave them on the soil surface and you can use that as a mulch as well. Um, for raised beds, I don't recommend a lot of cover crops, but the buckwheat in particular is really great for raised beds. And Hannah says she was talking about the tomato seedling transplanting oh. if the tomato plant gets really tall from that seedling transplanting okay gotcha yeah if you do end up getting a really tall tomato transplant don't prune it from the top um because like i said once you take that um that top growth point off you're not going to see any more growth from the plant um what i what you can do is you can do um, a trenching method of planting so you essentially plant if the plant is like this you you dig a trench and then lay the transplant on its side 
and then bury it. So just the growth tip, just that last, you know, couple inches of the plant are, are um, out of the soil and then let it grow. So if you do end up getting a leggy plant, something that's really tall, I recommend the trenching method and you can find um, kind of resources online for how to, how to do that. Um, Neil asked if you've tried Hugel culture raised beds. I have not. I have no, not. Most, heard of, most of my experience is in, in ground agriculture. Okay. Um, Maria is in Southern Alabama and she wants to know if she can grow okra in clay soil. Yeah, I think so. Um, we have, I mean, it, we have a heavy clay soil um, where we're at at Jones Valley. Um, we have done a heavy amending with compost and organic materials, um, but okra is pretty like sturdy and will survive a lot of different scenarios. So out of all of the summer crops, I recommend doing okra um, as like the easiest thing um, to grow in the summer. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions, anyone? <clears throat> And Neil noted that he used pine straw for mulching um, in the chat. Yeah, pine straw is good. Um, you do want to be um, cautious about using too much pine straw because it can acidify your soil. Mm. Um, so if you are looking to grow like things like blueberries, pine straw is really great. But I wouldn't use pine straw year after year in like annual vegetable beds um, because it will um, make your soil more acidic. And if you do like go to the edge where it is more acidic how do you fix that or can um, you fix that yeah you can fix that using lime okay yeah and neil said acidic tomatoes are the best <laughs> they are so good all right i'm not seeing any more questions um thank you so much jessica you have been a great addition to our lunch and learn series and I feel like I learned something new every time you present for the past two um, years um, so thank you for today and I hope everyone learned something that they can use for their summer gardens